Okay, this is Jerry Logan. Um, sociology, 1126, uh, Gender and Power. So this is actually the chap chapter one PowerPoint presentation. So of course on the Blackboard I have a link uh, in which you can access the book uh, for, for free. And also what I did was pulled information from chapter one of the book uh, and also information that I had as well from previous other courses. So I kind of combined everything. So if you see something in the PowerPoint presentation, uh, it is also in the book, but you may see something that's in the PowerPoint presentation that may not be in the book. So what I decided to do and started out with chapter one, um, the feminist perspective, I kind of just wanted to kind of get a combination of definitions so that you all understand the terminology which would be used throughout the course. So I've PowerPoint presentations uh, for each of the chapters. I'm going to try not to be as lengthy because uh, I am a lecturer. I teach three and a half hour courses, so I'm trying to avoid having a three and a half hour uh, PowerPoint presentation video, uh, which, you know, you're looking and say, man, it's about three hours. That's too long. So I'm going to try to fast forward or something, you know, no. So uh, worst case, you know, if it gets too long, I might break it out into different parts uh, in, in some of the chapters. So. Let me go ahead and get started. Uh, and remember, if you have any questions to let me know as well. So first thing we need to know is the definition. So they say studying women from a feminist perspective. Definition of a feminist is a person who supports engaging feminism. And so feminism, of course, I have another uh, slide that talks a little bit about more about the rise of feminism. Uh, but the feminist sociology is a conflict theory. Now, for those who have taken an intro to sociology course, uh, you're familiar with the conflict theory. Uh, also, if you have not taken the introductory course of sociology, you can feel free to definitely take my class, in which I get very, very detailed uh, regarding the different perspectives of the conflict theory, theory, symbolic interactionist theory, and the functionist theory. So those are the three main sociological theories. So therefore, in my intro classes, you know, I talk about these extensively, I apply each theory to a particular topic and give you the theory's perspective on how they feel regarding things such as crime and delinquency. Uh, strat social stratification, social class in the US, uh, global stratification, marriage and family, uh, race, ethnicity, sex, gender, so there's all these different perspectives that the, all these three main theories have. Uh, so if you're familiar with the conflict theory, they look at the inequalities that exist uh, among social classes. Um, they also look at conflicts, exploitation, and things like that. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later regarding this chapter, but conflict theory is a, which observes gender in its relation to power, both at the level of face-to-face -face interaction and reflects activity within a social structure at large and focuses include sexual orientation, race, economic status, and nationality. So people believe, many people believe that the feminist theory looks at, you know, exclusively on girls and women and that it has an inherent goal of promoting the superiority of women over men so from different studies that i've seen that they say no it's not about that it's not it's more of a equality thing uh but it's not so much as okay we're going to make sure that women overpower the men no that's not the uh the feminist theory foundation uh feminist theory have also been the viewing the social world in a way that illuminates the forces that create and support inequality oppression and injustice and in doing so, prom promotes the pursuit of equality and justice. So that's more the biggest thing is, is the equality should be placed. And if, remember when you're looking at this particular class and you look at a feminist perspective, we're going to go back hundreds and hundreds of years ago. We're going all the way back into the beginning of the of hunting and gathering society. Uh, and, and at some point throughout history, there is this continuous theme of the inequality and unfortunate inequality that exists uh, between, between men and women. That said, since the experiences, perspectives of women and girls were historically excluded from years from social theory. Now, just get into a little definition. So knowing the differences between sex and gender. So we look at gender stratification. 
males and females unequal access to property power and prestige kind of going to the max web of property power and prestige uh, sexuality person's sexual preference and identity and their behavior sex is your biological characteristics that distinguish uh, females and males basically what you're born with so you're born with your sex you choose your you know sexuality is your preference you know whatever you choose uh, and gender stratification does kind of focus on that the unequal access to property, power, prestige. Now, gender is a social position, a uh, set of social arrangements that are built around these uh, normative sex categories. Uh, it's actually based upon the behaviors and attitudes that a society considers proper for its males and females, masculinity and femininity. So you're born with your sex, but you get to choose your gender, you know, what's considered masculine or feminine. But when you look at any given society, there is a uh, definition and there's a socialization and there's a culture of what's considered this is masculine, this is feminine. And remember, when you're taking any type of course, especially sociology course, this is a global economy. It's not just what's in the United States. It's not just what's in what you see around the corner, your neighborhood, things like that. You have to explore and say, okay, this is the whole world we're talking about. So if we go over to another country, how is gender being defined as masculinity and femininity? If we go to this other country, so and, and so you're keeping in mind that we're going historical years back. We're also looking across the world as well, and we're trying to, you know, define different social positions and what's considered normative in that particular culture or country. Now, the gender roles are a set of behavioral norms. Of course, the norms, expectations of right behavior assume the company's one status as a man or a woman. So, again, the gender roles are the roles that we play. So, I have a lot of information in this particular chapter. There's a lot of information in the ongoing chapters. I just kind of wanted to throw some of these definitions out there first that we began to see what is the difference between them. So, you're born with your sex, you choose your gender, but then there's the assumed uh, expectations of gender based upon the society that you live in. Okay, this is considered masculine. This is considered feminine. And then at some point, these are the roles, the behavioral norms, just the expectations is, okay, you're a man, this is what you're supposed to do. You're a girl, you're a woman, you're, this is what you're supposed to do according to what society has set in place. And, and again, it gets reinforced through the social institutions. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit later. So, the hegemonic masculinity, it's a definition, which we'll be seeing throughout here, is a condition, the key word is a condition in which men are so-called dominant and privileged, and this dominance and privilege is considered invisible. It's a type of complete dominance of a group of people that it goes basically unnoticed by the people who are being dominated. Hegemonic masculinity refers to a societal pattern in which stereotypically male traits are idealized as the masculine cultural idea, explaining how and why men maintain dominant social roles over women and other groups considered to be feminine. So it's one of kind of when you see this term again, hegemonic masculinity, that you have a good definition for it. Uh, it's also a sociological theory revolving around how, much, how men take a prominent supreme position in society it is a theory based on explaining how women in society take a so-called backseat to the dominance men hold through a perceived superiority of women. And again, this is built between in the social institutions. And, and, and I do apologize for saying some of the terminology that comes from the intro course. The social institutions that take place are the family. Uh, one of the biggest social institutions is you know marriage and family. And when you end this, uh, family, there's a culture of the family, which also the family has a way of socializing its members, the kids, the growing up to be members of that family, but you also socializing them to be members of a society. So depending on the society that you're in, society is counting on you to say, okay, this is what we expect, let's say in particular to gender, this is what we expect how men are supposed to do, and this is what we expect women are supposed to do. And we're going to start out with these little kids and get into the gender socialization so that these kids are socializing to their gender roles. And these are the roles in which it's expected from the society, 
which contributes and continues to this hegemonic masculinity. So therefore, when you look at the social institutions, such as um, the education system, you look at the military, uh, mass media, uh, marriage, all these things, religion. So therefore, as they believe that the social institutions are in place, and if you go from a conflict theory perspective, that these social institutions are in place to manipulate and to continue this so-called male dominance uh, because of the fact that it's being reinforced. So re reinforced into the family say, hey, society is telling the family through the social institutions of the family saying, you know what, we want to keep this so-called male dominance going on, okay? And I say so-called male dominance because it should not be that way. I have a 20-year-old daughter, and I will not say, well, men dominate. No, that's not the truth. But historically, that has been the case and is being reinforced and is being taught again and again of this so-called dominance men hold and this so-called backseat that women are supposed to have. So therefore, if it's being reinforced through the social institutions, it becomes the norm and it becomes accepted. And once it becomes accepted, people believe it to be that way. And when you step against it, you have this historic moment of the rise of feminism in which these courageous ladies stepped up and said, hey, this is, we're not going to continue to accept this. And then they're like, whoa, what are you doing? Then, I'm, I'm, I'm lecturing a lot. So let me keep going because uh, I get the lecture. And so I'm just going to keep going with the PowerPoint. So as introduced now, the rise of feminism. It's a, con a consciousness raises movement to get people to understand that gender is an organizing principle of life. The philosophy that men and women should be politically, economically, and socially equally. Equal opportunities and respect. And, and that's the part I was leading into. Uh, that's why I want to pause for a minute to bring in this definition so you all can see with the rise of feminism and the three ways of feminism in which the ladies were saying, you know what, no, we're not just going to go along with what's being it, it taught to us from how we're supposed to behave, what is the norm, this is our gender roles. No, we're going to step out the box and we're going to push for equality. Very courageous, very historical. And that's what a lot of this course is about. Uh, and the fact that these brave women, uh, historic women, who have put forth an effort and made it very effective, in my opinion, that it has changed society and that this rise of feminism is very important throughout not just the United States, but across the world. Because if you think back between hundreds and hundreds of years ago, remember women couldn't vote, women couldn't own property, and it was just based upon what the men had, what the men do. And so therefore, ladies like, no, I want to be able to vote. I want to be able to own property. You know, I want to be able to do a lot of things. So their first wave of feminism was the right to vote in which the 19th Amendment. And you got to think back hundreds of years ago when they're like, oh, ladies and other women is, you know, are saying to them like, no, no, this is not how it's go. We have not been socialized. And this is not a part of the so-called gender roles. And this hegemonic masculinity is existing. So therefore, we can't do that. So there's a form of opposition among other women because at some point it becomes the norm and the culture of that society. But these women bravely stepped forward and stated, hey, you know what? We're going moving forward with this. And it was very successful. The 19th Amendment was passed. You know, and it's continued more work that the ladies continue with the second wave equal pay in the workplace. Huge thing. And it continues to exist today, the unequal pay in the workplace. And the third wave of feminism focus on the problems of women in least industrialized nations to challenge, you know, the way they're not just looking at the women of the United States, these courageous women. And I'm a, we're going to talk about that later on in other ch in chapters, how they looked at women in other countries. They looked out for them, too. Like, no, it's not just here in the United States. We're looking out for all the women in the world. They also challenged gender roles and sexuality. What? You know, men saying, well, women are supposed to behave this way and women this. And these traditional gender roles have been challenged and say, hey, you know what? Why does a man have to say how we're supposed to act and think and feel? Who gives them that authority? But it's almost become a part of the norm and culture of that society. And again, we are socializing to these gender roles that we believe in. It becomes accepted in that hegemonic masculinity. So gender, 
gender established patterns of expectations for people. Again, as I stated earlier, it's a pattern, an expectation of how people are supposed to act. It orders our daily lives and it is one of the fundamental blocks of society, the social institutions of law, family, education, the economy, it mentions everything, okay? It's a process of forming a gendered identity uh, which starts before a person is even born, as soon as the fetus is identified. So we're already developing and saying that, you know, we have these gender reveal parties, okay? If it's a boy, it's blue, girl's pink. So we're already getting that idea of, okay, you, you don't have to say nothing. You can just do the gender re reveal party and you, I don't know, bust open something and, and here's blue. You're like, oh, it's a boy. We don't automatically assume, okay, the, the bust open whatever thing that they use for the party and some blue and we say, oh, you got a girl. And then somebody said it, they'd be like, what are you talking about? It's, a, it's blue, the color's blue, it's a boy. Or the color's pink, it's a girl. What do you mean that's a little boy? And we have become then saying, okay, we have a little girl, we have a little boy, and we become not even thinking about it sometimes. We ideally set aside and start thinking about the colors of what it's supposed to be. And I challenge in my intro class with my other students, I talk to them and say, what happens if you have a little boy and a family member, you know, whoever it may be, mother-in-law, somebody, uh, you know, comes in and, and paint the little boy's room pink and have pink everything, you know, the comforter and everything's pink. And then we're like, oh, you know, and I'm going to say we as individuals, we'd be like, well, wait a minute, that's a, that's a boy. Why is everybody's room pink? You know, he, he's not supposed to have a pink room. He's a boy. So we're already going into the expectations of patterns that we are being uh, uh, learned of gender identity and we're learning again it says number two the process and we're already grooming these boys to be this way we're already grooming these girls to this way and through socialization and personality development a child requires a gender identity that in most cases key word in there it reproduces again it reproduces the attitudes the values and actions that his or her social environment deemed suitable for a boy or girl so at that point you think about little kids and, and i talk about gender socialization uh through the um the other uh class, intro class that i have when we look at gender socialization and we're looking at the fact that okay this is a boy and we automatically we give them toys for little boys you know let's think about some of the toys for little boys we give them a G.I. Joe, action figures, sports, building blocks, all these different things. And then it's a little girl. You give them dolls. You give them, I guess I'm kind of older, but baby alive. They got baby, baby dolls. And so at that point, we're already socializing these kids into their gender role. So this little girl who gets this baby doll, which is almost as, as, as equivalent to an infant, where she's learning at a young age how she is supposed to care for a child. She's also learning, here's a cooking set, here's a kitchenette set, about doing you know, household chores. And there's nothing wrong with that. I've done that for my little girl. But I'm just saying is this the expectations that this is a part of the gender culture. And at some point, if we reverse the role and we give this little boy a baby doll, and this little boy tying up this little baby doll's hair, and he's holding a baby, he's got a kitchenette, and someone, not everyone, someone may question and say, no, that's a boy. We're not supposed to do that. That's for girls because we've been socialized to believe that way. But we're socializing from historically into these gender roles for young girls saying, okay, traditionally back then, homemaker, a woman stay home, take care of the kids, going back to a hunting and gathering society. The woman stays at home, she takes care of the kids, she keeps the house clean. So therefore, we are reinforcing that gender socialization with that little girl and giving her these type of toys that's going to almost, you know, socialize her into that gender role of expectations of how society wants her to be. She can grow up, as my daughter as well, grow up and do anything she wants to be. I tell my daughter, you can do anything you want. But at the same time, society is saying, hey, we want this. As you see the first one, gender established patterns of expectations for people. They're starting out with little babies, little boys. You give them action figures, you know, you give them toy guns, this 
you're giving them building blocks, all this construction stuff, and so you're already developing sports with this little boy. Oh, yeah, my son's going to play football. He's going to do this. And you're giving these expectations of what these little boys are, and they grow up. And at the same time, you know, they, they're trying to learn their so-called role of being an adult. And we'll get into a little bit more about the psychoanalytic theories and, and things like that, which talks more about their gender socialization. So patriarchy, uh, historically, is a system of society or government in which the father or eldest man is head of the family and descent is traced through the male line. There's also a nearly universal system involved in the subordination of femininity and mass to masculinity. Uh, it's most commonly understood as a form of social organization in which cultural and institutional beliefs and patterns accept, support, and reproduce the domination of women and younger men by older or more powerful men. Uh, definition is a literally the rule of the fathers. Today, sociologists view patriarchy, any system that contributes to the social, cultural, and economic superiority. Uh, here's that word again, hegemony of men. It's also a social structure which men are considered to have a monopoly on power and women to expect it to submit. Uh, these they are both social, biological, social constructionist explanations of patriarchy. Uh, so when we look at the patriarch society, we're going back. And like I say, we're not talking about right now. You know, a lot of us uh, are not accepting this so-called patriarch society. A lot of us, our daughters, you know, as children, we say, hey, our daughters, this is equal. You know, I have a daughter, so of course, very equal to me, you know, so... I'm not going to push a patriarchal society on my daughter. I'm not going to push a hegemonic masculinity on my, on my daughter because she has the expectations to do anything that anyone else can do. So we're going back even historically for years and years and years ago, even when kings would pass on their bloodline and their royalty over to their sons. And, and you know, not having a daughter, they were like, okay, well, my son gets this, my son gets this. So we're not just talking about now, and we're not talking about an accepted social pattern of where we this is it we believe in this because that's just not the structure that we have today uh so when we get into these uh theories uh this talk card parsons a famous sociologist has uh what he calls sex role theory theory uh as a functionist perspective it is a theoretical tradition claiming that every society has certain structures the family and if you are familiar with the functionist perspective, um, and, and like I say, the functionist perspective looks at groups of interrelated parts or groups that work together to help society function as a whole. And any type of thing that can throw it off would be a dysfunction, which would cause equilibrium to society, uh, unequilibrium. So we're looking at the certain structures, the family, the division of labor agenda that exists to fulfill some set of necessary functions. Of course, reproduction of the species and production of goods from a fun functionist perspective. Um, talk about Parsons' theory that men and women perform their sex roles as breadwinners. Okay, that was the traditional role of men and wives and mothers, respectively, because the nuclear family, according to the functionist perspective in Parsons, is the idea arrangement in modern societies fulfilling the function of reproducing workers, having more kids. So they're saying, okay, look, this is the bread, this is men, you know, and, and think back, and I don't want to complicate this by no means. I just want you all to just kind of relax a little bit. I stole some of the terminology out of it. Just look at how we were raised up, how we were socialized in our household, our neighbor's households, other family households, and this was the man's role, and this was the woman's role, and who did what part. Uh, traditionally, if you go back to, you know, your parents, you go back to your grandparents, your great-grandparents, and what has the tradition have been as far as the men role and the women role, you know? And so the sex role of, okay, the man, you are provider, protector, you're the breadwinner, this is your role. And, and then there's the wives, you're the mother and run the household and keep the house in order, take care of the kids. You know, and a lot of us have watched the parents, our parents or grandparents or other family members function in that role. And then you somewhat say, okay, well, man, I'm as an adult, I'm starting to get into that same role, which is the theory which Parsons talk about. 
Uh, it was based in structure according to a more traditional family structure in that the men was the work-oriented contributor, the breadwinner, and the women was the domestically uh, oriented part of the housewives of the man ensuring the home, church, and the day-to-day household functions were tended to. So again, just kind of just take a second, think back and say, you know, how was I raised up? You know, if, if both parents were in the household, if they were not in the household, uh, if they're you know, what was the role that you observed for watching your mom, your aunt, caretaker, whatever it may be, just knowing the role of it, it's, it's the, like as a child. And, and I don't want to complicate this because we're talking about everyday life and we're saying, okay, think about it. So just take a moment, kind of think about it, say, man, you know, how does the, the role, you know, and what is my expectation as an adult? And some of y'all have kids and may have kids one day. Uh, and then say, how would I raise my child? You know, how, what I want them to perceive is the role for the man, role for the woman. And it's up to you as an individual. Society is not going to determine how you're going to raise your kid. But think back in a structure in society where that was the norm. You know, even in the agricultural society before capitalism and stuff emerged, the Industrial Revolution emerged, you know, that was the, that was the norm. That was the expectation. This is how we're going to raise our children up. So you have your own choice of how you want to do that. Uh, getting into the psychoanalytic theories, um, this approach focused on the importance of the unconscious mind, not the conscious mind. So it's got a lot of information about the psychoanalytic theories, talking about uh, Freud. In other words, the psychoanalytic perspective dictates that behavior, but they look at your past experiences that are left in the unconscious mind Basically, people are unaware of them, okay? It's a personality theory, which is based on the notion that an individual gets motivated more by unseen forces that are controlled by the conscious and the rational thought. If you are familiar with Sigmund Freud, uh, it's closely related to, to the psychoanalytic theory. Now, some of us are familiar with Sigmund Freud. I uh, always tell students, continue to do more research. So you look up more information on Sigmund Freud. Uh, and I'm not getting too much of deep detail about some of the stuff that Freud talked about. If you're familiar with Freud, so I'm not going to get too much detail about that. But girls and boys develop masculine and feminine personality structures through early interaction with their parents. So we look at a man, Freud, who's been born back in 1856. So you can imagine during that time frame, let's take you back to 1856, 59, 1900 back then there was no technology all the stuff we have today didn't exist you know and so Sigmund Freud was well respected in his field uh, his work was well respected people looked up to him people follow Sigmund Freud so all of these sociologists and psychologists and things like that philosophers at the time you know there was very little uh, technology that they have as we have today. So just put yourself in that mind frame thinking about what well, people, okay, here's Sigmund Freud. What does he have to say today? Uh, Freud's psychoanalytic theory of gender development suggests that gender development takes place during this third stage of this psychosexual theory of personality development. So, and not to get too much in detail, just kind of speaking a little bit about it, but the development of gender and psychoanalytic theory is different for boys and for girls. Boys experience, you are familiar with the Oedipus complex, and identify with their father and take on a male gender role. And girls experience, according to Freud, the Electra complex and identify with their mother and take on a female gender role. So I know it's more detailed than this. I didn't want to get too much all into the Oedipus complex. Uh, like I said, continue to do more research about it. Uh, you know, regarding this, uh, and, I, and I didn't, you know, put too much in the discussion questions about this, but I just want to kind of bring up how important, you know, Freud's input into the psychoanalytic theory of gender development. So there's also Nancy Chatterow. So she's 1978. Mother by women is reproduced in a cycle of role socialization in which little girls learn to identify as mothers and little boys as fathers. So again, if you, when you start having kids, you look at your younger siblings, and you're like, they're going to mimic what you do. I remember growing up, um, you know, my little brother, we're 18 years apart, so as a little kid, he would just watch what I do. 
you know, he was like, okay. So I would just, he would mimic what I do. You know, he's learning. So, he, you know, our little kids, they put on your shoes and he try to walk around in my shoes. Uh, and little girls sometimes would play dress up in a sense and they put on the mother's, you know, the woman's or sister's jewelry. They put on big hats and purses and try to walk with their so shoes. So remember kids have, you know, think back about that part when kids and even yourself as a child, think about how you are mimicking and watching your adults. And a lot of time, you know, little boys back then would look at their fathers, big brothers, some, you know, caretaker or uncle, grandfather, whoever it may be. So remember, kids are always watching us. That's why I tell people as adults, be careful what you say and do because the kids are watching everything that we do. And a lot of us are heroes to those persons, uh, to your little brothers and sisters. So it's great that you are setting a great example for your you know, younger siblings or your children by going to school, get your education, living a um, productive life, uh, free from crime, of course, not committing criminal acts and things like that because these kids are watching what you do so this is a process of role socialization in which we go back to the earlier chapters about gender role so they're watching what we do uh so chatterer argues that the mothers experience their daughters as their doubles and, and none of this stuff has to be like oh i'm a total agreement with it you can disagree with it that's fine you know there's a lot of things that you know you can hear about and say oh, i disagree with that part i agree with this part and that part and that's why in my discussion questions i value your opinion i never grade you on your opinion i just want to know what you're thinking because the scholarly people that you are your opinion does matter and the more you continue to think about stuff you know you're you know you're going to get into higher positions of power and authority your opinion matters now young person older person as a student i value your opinion so this is just information that nancy put out there she's one person she done the research you can agree or you can disagree with it but you can say well this is something new i learned it makes sense uh, she calls a narcissistic object attachment. The mother sees the daughter simply as an extension of her own life. Number two, it means that the daughters find it difficult to form their own identities. They are brought up with a strong capacity for empathy, empathy and intimacy, but they cannot achieve their desire of autonomy. So Chattero, the core gender identity of women, the narcissism, and this is from Chattero, so the core gender identity of women, she says, narcissism, lack of self-control, weak ego boundaries proceeds from the inability to discover separateness. So again, this is just information from her point of view. Um, desperate, the daughter turns to the father. The father represents the outside world here the daughter becomes aware of the social privileges uh, of the phallus. I, I think about this and I say a lot of times, and, and you know, this is me personally, you know, a lot of times with me growing up watching other girls that I've known and my little girl, a lot of girls kind of tend to their father. They kind of really tight with their father. And of course the guys, we're a little bit, me personally, a little bit softer on my daughter than if I had a son. So having little younger siblings that's 18, 20 years apart, I was hard on my little brother, my little sister. I was a little bit soft on her, so to say. So guys sometimes have a soft spot for their daughters. And daughters, oh, that's my daddy, you know. And they need to kind of look up as a hero, you know, as a father. So gentlemen, if you have a girls one day, uh, you kind of get that feel what I'm talking about, having a little girl. Uh, but at the same time, mothers love their sons and their daughters equally as well. Fathers do the same thing with their children, son or daughter. It's just something about having a little girl, so sometimes that, you know, that bond between them gets a little tight. Uh, for boys, the masculine identity is also achieved through their relationship with their mother. However, in this case, the boy discovers gender differences and encourages the boy to discover separateness. Uh, this is because the mothers experience their sons as separate from themselves. Note the difference from the relationship with their daughters. Uh, so this is a form of, a, of, of an eclectic objective attachment that um, Nancy Charterwell talks about. So dissociation um, with the fathers is edible, edible uh, stage is handled differently by boys and girls. Girls caught in a narcissistic relationship with the mother develop emotionally through relationships nurturing care and boys discover themselves through separation and independence 
Uh, the fathers represent the outside world for Chodoro. They have only nominal play roles to play. As she puts it, feminism is psychoanalytic theory. Paternal authority is the last ditch escape from maternal, you know, uh, I'm not, I can't pronounce it, well, I'm not, to just, excuse me. <laughs> All right, so according to the conflict theory, society is divine, defined by a struggle for dominance among social groups that compete for scarce resources. That's kind of the basis for the conflict theory. In the context of gender, conflict theory argues that gender is the best understood as men attempting to maintain power. Key word is the attempting to maintain power and privilege to the determinant of women. Uh, so with the conflict theory, Oh, uh, they look at source of power as a conflict, especially when it comes to marriage. And they talk about that, you know, the men have the ma power in the marriage and women trying to seek more power. That goes to my so intro to class, which talks about, you know, the conflict theory of marriage, which causes leads to a divorce and things like that. Uh, therefore, men can be seen as a so-called dominant group and women as a subordinate group. And remember, the dominant group may not outnumber you know, the subordinate group can outnumber the dominant groups. So it's not strength in numbers type of thing, but it's just who receives greater power, who has greater power, access to greater privileges. So the dominant group can be considered as the men in this part uh, and women as a subordinate group. Subordinate group are those who are being uh, mistreated unfairly, uh, not given equal access to things as the dominant group. Conflict theories claim uh, that gender, not class, was a driving force of history. The radical feminists claim that the rule of social relations, including relations of production, stem from unequal gender relations. In a capitalist society, women have a disadvantaged position in the job market and within the family. Conflict theory asserts that social problems occur when a dominant group mistreats the subordinate ones and thus advocates for a balance of power between the genders. Now, Frederick Engels, who worked closely with uh, Max, um, I'm sorry, Karl Marx, um, and I will talk about them later on in the chapters, uh, Frederick Engels and Marx, uh, they compared the family structure. So this is interesting. He compared the family structure to the relationship between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. So if we go back into Karl Marx a little bit and Engels, and, and Marx basically talks about the bourgeoisie capitalists, those who, own, who owns the means of production. So remember, it came from agricultural society to this industrial revolution, and capitalism evolved, and all these big factories are being built in the major cities. So therefore, if I'm living on a farm with my wife, everything's in change. They got railroads coming through. They got all these big buildings. They manufacturing goods and stuff like that. Now, they're no longer dependent on me, so-called agricultural lifestyle so it's like okay i gotta make some money so therefore i gotta go to the city you get to the city it's all these big buildings and all these factory jobs because you know you have to work and it's limited number of jobs and you got all the people trying to work and so the bourgeoisie is the ones who own the capital they were the capitalists they own the means of production these are factory owners and then the proletariat Paul marx considered it as the uh persons who are being taken advantage of. So the workers that exploited workers would be the proletariat. So therefore, as going back to my intro class, I may have to make reference in case no one has not taken my intro class. However, when you go to the proletariat, the proletariat is the one who, I'm getting to say I'm a proletariat, I'm, I'm considered as a proletariat, I'm a worker, and here I am working at this factory, I'm working 10 hours straight, get two minute break, so to say. Uh, not no cigarette break, which people so I, they need a cigarette break but I don't get a cigarette break I don't get a 15 lunch and nothing like that and so at some point I have to constantly work and then the capitalists will say hey you know if you don't feel like doing it there's a hundred people outside waiting to get your job right now so and then you start thinking about your family like now I got to get to it so therefore the exploitation that exists um, it's suggesting that women have less power than men in the household because they were dependent on them for wages Getting into the later chapters, I'm going to talk about it just kind of briefly introduce you. He talks about angles. He talks about how the, he looked at the marriages and he said for the bourgeoisie, and he said, man, you know what? The wives are almost equivalent as proletariats. 
uh, and that they didn't have in their wives, not their workers, their wives. So English threw it out there like the bourgeoisie, your wives, you know, wives of the bourgeoisie, you are like proletariats, you know, because uh, the men have the uh, power. And, and they believe that the bourgeoisie, the proletariat, uh, convinced the proletariats, the workers, and said, hey man, you know, you out here at work, you working hard for your money, and your wife's at home doing nothing. You know, they didn't, they didn't value the women's work, unfortunately. They didn't value the women's work for what they did at home. So the bourgeoisie was like, you know what? Um, you know, you guys out here working, you also have more say-so in your household. You all made, making money. They waiting, you know, wife waiting on you to eat, you know. And so they say that, they suggested that the women had less power than the men in the household because they were dependent on them for wages. So therefore they, you know, trying to convince the men sort of say, well, hey man, you know, why does she get to say this and this? And you the one making all the money. You the breadwinner. She just sitting home with the kid, watching TV with the kids. She's not doing nothing but her regular work. Don't don't value. They didn't value the women's work that they do. You know, and and, and what women did at home, taking care of kids and taking care of the household is work. It's just an unpaid type of labor, so to say. But then the men out here may not work as hard as the women do at home, but they receive wages, and therefore the proletariat would try. They were being convinced by the bourgeoisie to hey, uh, uh, man. You should be the head of your household. Look at my household. I bring in. I'm the factory owner. My wife, this, this, you know. But at the same time, they brought that into, them. you know, they brought that to the, to workers, to their head, and it caused a conflict in the marriage. You come home like, you know what, baby, I do all this work and you're not doing nothing, causing conflict, and that's what English talked about. Doing gender, so we're gonna look at symbolic interactions perspective, but that was a conflict theory. And like I said, it's gonna be a lot more information you know, through the rest of the class, but uh, to be a man or woman is to perform masculinity or femininity constantly, according to the micro-interactionist theories. They view gender roles as having open-ended scripts. As a result of doing gender, people contribute to reaffirm and reproduce masculine dominance and female submissiveness. So let's remember mm -hmm. I talked about early how it's being reinforced the gender roles to continue this hegemonic masculinity society in the sense that if we continue this role, men continue to perform masculinity and feminine, that's considered as a man, and no, as a woman, you're not considered being feminine if you do X, Y, and Z. So a man is telling a woman, this is what's considered, to, unfortunately, a man is telling a woman, this is what's considered to be uh, feminine, and that they have to continue to do gender in order to maintain these roles. Now, because the meanings attached to symbols are socially created, socially created and not natural, so that's the key word. These are socially created and not natural and fluid, not static. We act and react to symbols based on the current assigned meaning that it has. And when people perform tasks or possess characteristics based on the gender role assigned to them, that's when they say they are doing gender. It's cool. If you're just doing gender, you you play the role that you're supposed to. Oh, you're a girl, you're a guy. This is masculine, this is a feminine. This is what's been assigned to you because you are male and you are female. And that is what they're referring to as just being doing gender. Now, this this is notion based on the work of Weston Zimmerman. Whether we are expressing our masculinity or femininity, Weston Zimmerman argument, we are always doing gender. That gender is something we do or perform, not something we are. So therefore, we are performing this role and people are assuming this role because this is what we're supposed to do, doing gender, not based upon who we really are. You know, you see some people get out of character. You're like, well, that's not how they're really supposed to be and that's how they, how they really act, but some people just doing gender. In other words, both gender and sexuality are socially constructed. Not naturally, it is socially constructed. The social construction of sexuality refers to ways in which socially created definitions about the cultural, keyword appropriateness of sex linked behavior shape the way people see and experience sexuality. This is in marked contrast to theories of sex, gender, and sexuality that can link male and female behavior to the biological determinism or the belief that men and women have 
behave differently due to differences in their biology. Okay, so this is socially constructed. Let me switch over to the functions perspective. The functionists have provided one of the most important perspectives of sociological research in the 20th century and it has a major influence on research in the social sciences, including the gender studies. So I'm switching over a little bit. So I have talked about the conflict theory. Uh, first, I talked about parts and sex role theory. Then I switched over to the psychoanalytic theories with Chattero and um, um, Sig um, Freud. Then I switched on over to the conflict theory, switched over to the symbolic interactionist theory, and now I'm over to the functions perspective. So I have to slow it down for a second and say, hold on. Let me take a break for a second because I get the lecture and I'll be on a roll and I don't want to move on too fast. I want to just take a step by step. And a good thing, this is a video. You can pause it. You can relax for a minute, take notes to whatever you want to do to it. I remember the PowerPoint presentations are also uploaded uh, as well online on Blackboard. And at the same time, you have access to it uh, each week. So just making sure that I slow it down for a second. So viewing the family and this is part of the functions perspective they view the family as the most uh one of the most integral part components of society assumptions keyword assumptions about gender roles within their marriage assume a prominent place in this perspective functionists argue that gender roles were established well before the pre-industrial era when men typically took care of responsibilities outside of the home so now we're going to the hunting and gathering society, such as hunting, and women that took care, typically took care of the domestic responsibilities in or around the home. So remember, we're going back, and this is go back to my chapter eight, um, about sex uh, and uh, gender and sexuality in my intro class. And, and long story short, we're going to a hunting and gathering society. Remember, for a society to, to survive, that they had to have kids. So older people are dying out. People lived a very short life. You go way, way back to hunting and gathering society. So therefore, people were dying out. So therefore, you say, well, we need kids. And so you start having kids. And so with babies being born, there's not all this technology. There's not a hospital. There's not a prenatal uh, pills and, and doctors just waiting on them. So therefore, the women had to nurse these children. So remember, in the hunting and gathering society, the key thing is you have to go hunt for food. It's not like the animals just sit next to you like, okay, come kill me and you eat me. You got to go catch them. You know, you're not difficult that can be. So therefore, the men had went out and hunt to get the food. And then the women who were pregnant, who were at the same time nursing the child, because if the women didn't nurse the child, there's a good chance the baby could have died. So therefore, the women had to stay at home. Here she is with a newborn, you know, a two-year-old or one-year-old she's currently pregnant she can't and not saying that she physically can't not do it based upon her ability because women of course we know can do just as much or more as a man can of course physically so the women can go out there and hunt and, and run fast and catch food too but if she's six seven months pregnant and she has a one-year-old she's still nursing and she this is difficult for her to go run and catch animals and then you have to go to the location, so you have to be away from the home for a period of time. So that would cause much strain on having, a, you know, being pregnant and carrying a baby and taking care of a baby. So the men say, okay, baby, you stay at home. I'll go ahead and go hunt. You know, and so that's where they're kind of talking about this part right here. So I kind of get it briefly, just kind of talked about it. I got a whole chapter on this stuff like this, but right now I just kind of briefly talked about it, about the hunting and gathering society which the men worked outside of the home. They did the hunting and women and took care of the domestic responsibilities. So the women like, okay, well, if they're going to get the meat, I'm going to grab this little stuff over here and make a little side dish, so to say. I'm going to keep the house clean and I'm going to watch the kids. So we're going back to hunting and gathering society uh, years and years ago, hundreds of years ago. These roles, if you know the function's perspective, they were considered functional because women were often limited by the physical restraints of pregnancy and nursing and not able to leave the home for long periods of time. Once established, these roles were passed on. That's the key word. It was established. That was the rule. It was established. This is how we roll every day. 
of course, the first part, okay, you know, baby, I got to go get something to eat. I got to go lead a home for long periods of time. We have to eat. Now, sometimes they're going out there. They run into other men, the tribes of the men. Y'all, they might have fought. They might have traded weapons and stuff like that. So the men was like, okay, we're in charge. You stay at home, I'll be back. But the key thing is once established, these roles were passed on to subsequent generations since they served as an effective, keyword is effective means of keeping the family system functioning properly. That's a huge paragraph right there. Once established, these roles are passed on to subsequent generations since they served as, as a keyword effective means of keeping the family system functioning properly. Now, when changes occurred in the socioeconomic climate of the United States during World War II, changes in the family structure also occurred. So many women had to assume the role of breadwinner or modern hunter and gatherer alongside the domestic role in order to stabilize the rapidly changing society. Okay. So remember the men, the World War II, the men left. They went out to the war. Okay. They're gone. Jobs have become available as well. And then they're manufacturing machinery, just say equipment. You all know the history of this. You all know this stuff. They are manufacturing equipment. So it created more jobs. So the women were like, hey, I got to keep the family going. The women said, you know what? I'm the breadwinner now. But I still got to take care of this family. You know, so they had both of them. The women had to assume the role of the breadwinner alongside the domestic role in order to stabilize and rapidly change the society because society's changing now. But when the men returned from war and wanted to reclaim their jobs, they want their jobs back, society fell back into a state of imbalance, which is the key word of the functions they talk about the imbalance, as many women did not want to quit and forfeit their wage earning positions. So the man said, okay, war's over, we back, I want my job back. And the women were like, wait a minute, hold, I've been holding this down. I've been able to do both. Something that, you know, we couldn't, you, people thought we couldn't do. I'm doing both of them. I got the job, I'm making money. I'm doing very well, and I'm holding it down with the kids. Mm -mm. Many women did not want to forfeit that. They're making money. So now that's the whole big problem. So now that's what the functionists look at this. A so-called problem because the men are like, wait a minute, hold on. So today, women who work full-time earn on average 80% of what men earn working full-time. An improvement over time, no doubt, but they said an, an income gap nonetheless. 27% of all households headed by women are poor. They say the rates are higher for African-American women, Latinas, and Native American women. And women of color are concentrated in the least paid, lowest status jobs in the labor market. So Adriana Rich, uh, 1976, was a classical, classic feminist thinker and poet, suggested almost 40 years ago that simply asking, what is life like for women? It creates a new awareness of the status of women in society and history. So whether it is asking, why is there so much violence against women? Or why is it that women claim the offices and men manage them by virtue of asking, just even asking, you are creating new questions and issues for investigation. It is a process of questioning that gave birth to a sociological and a feminist imagination. C. Wright Mills, uh, he, he very popular guy in my intro class. I talked about them. He talks about the power elite, in which he says that we are looking at some of the problems that we have in society, but let's look at the power elite and the problems that they're causing in so many words. He looked at the power elite as the people, the military leaders, the politicians, the rich people, and, and a lot of people began to say, you know, that's where you got the protests from the Vietnam War and different stuff, and people were kind of following C. Wright Mills and say, wait a minute, hold on. It's the government, you know, to a degree. He's an eminent, now, he died a very young man, 1916, 1962. He's an eminent sociologist and radical in his times. His radicalism was founded in part of his passionate belief that the task of sociology is to understand the relationship between individuals. And that's what I just talked about in society in which they live. C. Wright Mills argued that sociological understanding must be used in the reconstruction of more 
just social institutions. Except for the masculine references in his language, his words still provide a compelling argument that sociology must make sense of the experiences of women and men as they exist in contemporary society. Sorry about that thing. Trying to get me to buy something. Nope, I ain't buying it. Nope. He writes, uh, nowadays men often feel that their private lives are a series of traps. They sense that within the everyday world they cannot overcome their troubles and in this feeling they are often quite correct. Mills further states that what ordinary men are directly aware of and what they try to do are bounded by the private orbits in which they live. So Mills comes up with the sociological imagination. Okay, it enables this, and this is one of the discussion questions that talks about C. Wright Mills. Uh, so make sure you review this as well. Uh, enables this possessor to understand a larger historical scene in terms of its, un for its meaning for the inner life and external career of a variety of individuals. So the first fruit of this imagination and the first lesson of social science that embodies this is that the idea that the individual can understand his experience, engage his fate only by locating himself within his period, that he can know his chances in life only by becoming aware of those of all individuals and his circumstances. Mill's ideas are strikingly parallel to the feminist argument that women can see how their private experiences are rooted, this is huge, are rooted in social conditions by discovering their shared experiences with other women. The sociological imagination. In fact, Mill professes that the central task of sociology is to understand personal biography and the social structure and how the two are related. His argument is best illustrated in the distinction he makes between personal troubles and the social issues. Personal troubles, according to Mills, are part of the personal experience of an individual. They are privately felt and they involve only those persons in events and in individuals, just the folks immediate, your immediate surroundings, so the folks around you, the only ones, because it's kind of a private thing. Public issues, so it's personal and it's public. Public issues are events that originate beyond one's immediate experience, even though they are still felt in your private life. Public issues involve the structure of social institutions, as I spoke about earlier, and their historical development. Mill's own example is that of marriage. He says, inside a marriage, a man and a woman may experience personal troubles, which is true. But when the divorce rate during the first four years of marriage is 250 out of every 1,000 attempts, it's an indication of a structural issue having to do with the institutions of marriage, as we talked about earlier, and the man and the family and other institutions that bear upon them. So it's not so much as just, just me and me and me and the wife getting into it. This is some common. This is, other people got the same problem. It ain't maybe just us. Maybe it's a structural issue. Is what. Mills is leading to. Another example is that of a woman who was beaten, unfortunately, beaten by her partner. She experiences deep personal trouble. Perhaps her situation appears to her as unique or as only a private matter. But when others in society have the same issue, the same problem, they experience the same thing, then it becomes a public issue. Common patterns and experiences of battered women reveal that battering is more than just a private matter. From C. Wright Mills. It has its origins in the complex, again, as I talked about at the beginning, the social institutions. These social institutions that define women as subordinate to men and men as holding power over women. In other words, in power relationships formed by gender. And in sense, battering is both a personal trouble, but it's also a public issue. As Mills will conclude, it is then a subject for sociological study. For feminists, this junction between personal experiences and the social organization of gender roles is also a starting point for thinking about women. So thinking about women from a sociological perspective asks us to look beyond and take it for granted ways of seeing the world and instead to see how social structures generate. And this is huge. The social structures generate the patterns of everyday life. This is an ongoing thing which we've been talking about throughout the whole chapter. The concept of social structure is central to sociology, which does include the social institutions. 
The social structure refers to the organization of society. It shapes the social behavior and the social attitudes. This is a broad and abstract concept, one that emphasizes the collective and social basis for behavior, not individual motivations and actions. Now, of course, abstract reality and social structure, structure ultimately have their origin in how people behave, individuals behave, that's true. But it is the collective and persistent results of their behavior that make the social structures. Remember, the social structures shape individual and group choices, opportunities, and experience. People can feel the effects of social structures and most of what they do. Okay? So men's studies also explicitly feminist. In fact, men's studies emerged from the women's movement when men, too, began to see how gender and sexism shaped their lives. The study of men challenges existing sexist norms just as women's studies do. Men's studies also has an active stance. It is not just knowing about men that is important. Men's studies encourages using that knowledge to create a more just world. Okay? So faulty generalizations take knowledge from one group experience and incorrectly extends that knowledge to another. Now, when we're looking at women's studies, it's shown how not to generalize from the experience of men to the experience of women. So you develop an inclusive thinking reminds us that women's experiences vary. Of course, they're different variables, such as race, you know, a woman's race, her social class, her age, her sexual orientation, and other social factors. So women groups, although women as a group share many common experiences, but they also look at, the author looks at the recognizing and understanding that the diversity of these experiences are equally important in the construction of descriptions and theories about women's lives. So there's other variables that exist. So the author points in a lot in this book, she talks about, uh, she talks about social class, she talks about uh, race a lot, and then different women experience different things based upon your race and social class. And it's even as just men, it's individuals in general. A different race may experience something a little bit different. A person in a different class may experience different things here. A lot of different social factors. Now, the term double jeopardy, for example, has been used to describe the disadvantage that women of color experience because of their race and their gender. Kind of get into the intersectionality theory as well. This phrase, however, conjures up images of race and gender as separate experiences where they are related in experiences of different groups. Race, class, sexual orientation, and gender, they form a matrix of domination, meaning that particular configuration of race, class, and gender relations to society that together establish an interlocking system of domination. Not one of them can really be understood without understanding the other. Considering the following, according to the author, so the author makes reference to this a lot, she states that white women may be privileged by their race, but disadvantaged by their gender and class. Okay, so keep in mind, but likewise, African-American men may be privileged by their gender, but not necessarily by their race or social class. In fact, thinking about race and class oppression in the lives of African-Americans, Native Americans, and Latino men makes a term such as male privilege, they say, seem out of place. According to the author, although men of color may have gender privilege relative to women within their group, relative to white women, they likely do not. So remember, sociology is an empirical discipline, meaning it's based on careful and a systematic observation. Connected to feminist thought, a sociological perspective helps you see gender is not naturally, but is a socially structured phenomenon. So that's all I have. I know you're like, man, this dude is long-winded. I get it. I am a lecturer. Some of the chapters are pretty much longer. This is one of my uh, in-between, shorter chapters. But however, I just wanted you to have, I, I like to lecture because I'm not sitting in front of you all in the Zoom meeting or I'm not sitting in front of you all in the sense of the classroom. Uh, but even still, I'm going to keep these PowerPoint presentations because it makes, it helps the student, you know, relate to what's, instead of just throwing a PowerPoint, say, here, go for what you know, uh, good luck to you. You know, I think it helps if I just try to explain it the best way I can. So I hope this video did help you out. Uh, I'm going to continue having these videos uh, to help our students get a better understanding. Uh, so feel free, of course, you know, to hit me up any questions. 
uh, anything like that. Uh, and remember, this is information I got from the book as well. So any questions, anything, feel free to send me an email.